Anything political? Question mark. Question mark. Politics, right? I mean, that's something that we all, you cringe a little bit when you hear that, you know? I do. I cringe. Uh, the science of government it seems to have infected everything in life these days, hasn't it? When I was a kid, there was a saying, I don't know if this is a saying anymore because I really don't see it in effect ever, but never talk about religion and politics, right? Uh, because those were just such super hot button issues. You should never bring those up in polite conversation. Uh, being a Christian never allowed me to take the first piece of advice, and now I'm going to talk about the second. <laughs> so uh, somebody might need to smack me when this is over. But I try to put effort into speaking about relevant things, things that are happening around us, things that we really have to deal with. I, you know, when I went to school, I, I was always taught, well, just do these exegetical lessons based on just the text and, and don't move outside of exactly what it says. But I, I think that there is something to say uh, for how do we deal with this world that we're living with and how can the Bible kind of point us in that direction? How can it shape our worldview? Not just like a Bible class, but like a class on life, you know? And, and I think the Bible does function that way. Um, ways that we should react to our surroundings. Wisdom. You know, I, I, I try to avoid uh, taking... Democrat or Republican or any other party positions. And instead, what I'm really trying to do, what I'm aiming to do, uh, is to go for Christian ones. And this is primarily because we are not really a people of this world, per se, but we're a people of God, are we not? Uh, it says in uh, 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But you are a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, powerful statement about not being part of this world. And Jesus told us something essentially very similar uh, as he was waiting uh, his execution, when he was speaking to Pilate. Christ is the king of heaven and the realm of all things spiritual. Those who hear his voice come to the truth and become citizens of the kingdom of God, don't they? It says um, in John 18, 36 and 37, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. If we are Christians, then the place where we owe our allegiance, our politic, is to the truth. It is to Jesus Christ, His, the kingdom of God. All Christians should belong to this one party system, God's party, right? We should look at the world around us and encounter it with a heavenly purpose, a heavenly purpose in order to share truth. We should look at political issues set before us and take positions on them for godly reasons. Um, but how does that look realistically? You know, because there's still a lot of tension and disagreement, isn't there? A lot of people believe that church should be completely uninvolved in politics, the science of government. Does this mean that we should not advocate for anything and just remain silent about stuff? Should we just stay out of things? Well, I know a lot of people do feel that way, especially for the, the sake of peace and harmony. And part of me feels that. Part of me, definitely, my heart is there. <laughs> um, go along to get along has always been a favorite thing for me to do. Um, but we have a responsibility to represent Christ. We have a responsibility to 
be his ambassadors. We are of his kingdom, and we're here to affect change in this one. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul says, uh, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. This passage would seem to indicate that we have to take some positions, sometimes, don't we? Just like ambassadors from a foreign land advocate for their countries, so we as aliens living in this land should advocate for the kingdom of God, right? That would be a, a logical response. That we would have a responsibility to engage and advocate for God in this world that we are all living in. Because we want people to know that there's something better than what there is in this world. We want to be lights, don't we? We want to spread God's light to a world that's mired in darkness. We want to show people the path, don't we? We want to show people the way to freedom out of all of the things that make this world so bad. The question then remains, how do we do this? How do we advocate for Christ in a world that is more interested in thinking about itself than having a relationship with its creator? It's a difficult question. It's a hard thing to answer. When I'm trying to search for answers, I find that the Bible tends to be a good, uh, a good place to get those answers. I think we can gain a lot of insights from the things that are happening in the Bible. You know, people think because this happened, the New Testament happened like 2,000 years ago, that there can't be anything relevant in there to us today. But, you know, there, there couldn't be anything further from the truth because the conditions, the difficulties that, that challenge us on a fundamental level have always been there, will always continue to be there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some, some passages and, and point them out. Some of these things that are in the Bible are things that we're dealing with most severely even today. So Jesus was always an advocate for God, and much of what he taught intersected with political ideologies of the time. He, Jesus was political uh, in the sense that because God's commands made them political, people felt like it was they were political positions, even if they were only godly positions. And that's, and that's really the, the answer to that question, isn't it? I, I mean, that I asked er, earlier, are we supposed to be political? I think necessi out of necessity, we end up being that way, whether we like it or well, whether we don't, because what we advocate for, what we represent, is going to be at odds with some people and some governments and some things, right? And by that very nature, we end up being political. Um, one of the first examples that I want to bring you to uh, is the idea of racism, right? It's a massively political issue even today, 2,000 years after Jesus, right? One of Jesus' earliest interactions in the Gospel of John was with a Samaritan woman at a well. A, po a politically safe Jew of the day would have never had any dealings with that woman and would have never even stepped foot in the country that was called Samaria. They would have went around it. it it's, it's, it's impressive the level of racial animus that existed between Jews and Samaritans, something that we might not even be able to understand even now. So she even says that. Uh, when she says this in uh, John 4, 9, she goes, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, that's Jesus, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Right? From a worldly political standpoint, from the pro pro proper, uh, proper, bleh, can't talk today, proper culture of his day, Jesus should have avoided this lady. He should have even hated her because she was different than he was. But Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't do that, does he? He moves beyond race, and that would have been a strong political statement at the time. He's not being a political person per se, but what he does has a political impact, doesn't it? Because he stands up and he takes 
a strong position for God as God's ambassador. Even though the Samaritan woman was different from him, even though her culture, her background, her political leanings, and many of the things that were different about her, Jesus was not concerned with those things, was he? He didn't, didn't seem to be worried about any of those things. Jesus was bringing the message of the gospel. Jesus was bringing the message of God. Jesus was taking a godly decision that had strong political ramifications. Jesus went down to that well to tell this woman about everlasting water. And she said, give me some of that water. Right? Some people say that this interaction is color blindness. That the gospel, God's word, advocates for a color, colorblind society. In a way, in a way it does. Um, but what it truly represents, though, is something that, that there is something more important than any differences that we have based on our race. There is something more important than the differences that we may have in our politics or in our personal beliefs. There is something more important by which we should and must be unified. That God sees us as individuals. He doesn't see us for the things that we cannot control. That we have no ability to change. You know, this country had a fight, a war, 150 years ago where almost 700,000 people died. And they had that war to come up with the same conclusion that it's better to come together and be unified. <laughs> they came to a message that Jesus Christ was teaching 2,000 years earlier, and he didn't kill anybody. Jesus reached out to the Samaritans because they are people and they're all made in the image of God. He had a message of joy and redemption that crossed through politics and around race and gender. And he called on us to be strong enough to rise above those things and seek the unity of God instead of the division that people find so often. Another place where Jesus waded into the political sphere was when he decided to reach out and associate with canceled people, the unpersoned. Jesus um, went to the pariahs of society and he sought to redeem them. It was unpopular to do so, and when he did, he was making a very political statement with his actions. If you look at Matthew 9, 10 through 13, it says, Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus again wades into this political sphere, this unpopular place, because of truth. The truth interrupted this cultural and societal narrative, didn't it? These people were supposed to be outcasts. They were supposed to be pariahs because they did not fit into the cultural norms of their day. But he accepted them anyway. He went to them anyway to teach them the truth, to let them know that the gospel was for them too. They were effectively these canceled people. And one of those canceled people was the Apostle Matthew, who gave us the gospel. The acceptance of societal pariahs was a strong political statement. It was political. It was political to the ruling class. They did not appreciate it. They did not like it. Jesus, again, was not seeking to necessarily be a political person, but his quest to spread God's message made him one. 
He didn't have a choice. He inadvertently did become political when he did those things. His main focus, though, was always advancing God's will. He was an ambassador for God. Right? Jesus was concerned with the work of his Father above all things. And those things often interacted and intersected with the politics of his day. When people tried to get Jesus to wade into it overtly, like obviously, try to get him to pick a side, he only chose one side. He would only choose God's side. And I think a good example of that is Mark 12, 13 through 17. It says, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and then Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. And they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. But teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God, and they were amazed at him. You know, they, they start out the whole thing explaining that Jesus is this person who is there to tell the truth, right? And he says, well, since you're here to tell the truth, Jesus, and since you're here to advocate for God, why don't you tell us what side to pick? But he doesn't do that, does he? He tells you, you choose God. You don't choose the the Caesar or whatever, you know, you don't choose the Romans and you don't choose the Jews, you choose God. That's who you choose. You know, we might call whatever political parties these two different opinions, right? Now, but that should be our answer too, to think like Jesus thinks. What is the truth? What is the right thing to do in any particular situation? Well, that's what we should do. They tried to make Jesus wade into politics on their terms, on human terms. Jesus was having none of that, though. And in a brilliant way, Jesus again stayed true to himself and true to God, and he told them to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I wonder how many of us would have been strong enough to have an answer like that or to say the same, to make our life and our priorities about God rather than about ourselves. So, there's one more example uh, of, that I want to share with you. You can probably find more than, than what I've chosen here this morning because there's, there's a number of them. But there's one more example uh, of Jesus moving into the per- political arena that I want to discuss. And um, that is concerning what, probably one of the most political things that he did. And that was turning over the tables in the temple courts. The incident touched on lots of things, but mainly on social justice and also on respect for God, right? Devotion to God in all things. The social justice aspect is that rich and influential, powerful merchants, uh, the ruling class set up shop to extort poor people, basically, uh, in the temple. They would say, oh, your, your goat has like a, a mark on it and you have to buy one of our goats, but it's going to cost you big time. <laughs> you know? Or they'd say, oh, your money is, is no good. You have tainted money, so you have to buy good money. And, and in order to buy good money, the exchange rate is really terrible. But I'm sorry, if you want to offer God a sacrifice, you're going to have to buy our money in order to exchange it. And we'll take your dirty money off your hands. Don't worry. We'll take care of that for you. So that's, that's what they were doing. And they were, they were extorting poor people and pilgrims that had traveled long, long, far distances uh, just to offer a sacrifice to God, just to be in the temple. And, and Jesus sees this abuse and that they're doing it in the name of God, and he is rightly, horribly offended. And this is, this is what uh, takes place if you look at John 2, 13 through 17 says the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple 
with the sleet with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered what was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. This was a very political thing to do. It just was. This final political act by Jesus ultimately is what most scholars uh, who study scripture say led to Jesus getting killed. This is why they killed him. Okay, This happens later on in every gospel except for John's. John's is not chronologically ordered. But... Um, So this was like the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, they were annoyed by Jesus, by all these other things that he was doing, but this was like a bridge too far. They were like, you know what, now we're mad. And that's what leads to their fake, phony trial, false witnesses, all that stuff, and then ultimately to his crucifixion on the cross. That's what what happens because he flipped over the tables and he hurt them in the money. Um... Jesus was moved to act, though, in the interest of God, right? To show God's light. In a place that was supposed to be dedicated and devoted to God, they were doing awful, terrible, evil things. We, as ambassadors for Christ, should be compelled to do those same things. To be the voice in this world for God. That's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus asks us to do, right? Paul said we are ambassadors. Jesus addressed problems with race because God wants us to be unified, not separated by the things that we cannot control and by cultures that we may not understand. Because God transcends all race. Because he made us all in his image that that bring, should bring us together. Jesus addressed problems with cancel culture and pariahs because all people are worthy of redemption. Everybody is worthy of forgiveness. God wants all people to be saved. Right? So each of us has an, an equal worthiness in that regard. None of us deserve it, but God has seen fit to give it anyway. And he holds it back from no one. And we should remember that we're all sinners and we all struggle with our own demons. And that we should have a heart of forgiveness and make every effort to understand and be merciful instead of an elitist and being judgmental. Jesus addressed issues with social justice because we all have a duty to love our neighbor and treat others the way that we want to be treated. Class and social position have little or nothing to do with the kingdom of God. These are all God positions that end up being political positions, that end up making us unpopular with certain people. But we're not here to be popular, are we? You know, if we were popular, then this church would be thousands and thousands of people, wouldn't it? But it's not popular because most people are only looking out for themselves instead of looking out for God. And that's what makes being a Christian different. That's why we're not Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians and Greens and all this other kind of stuff. We're just Christians, aren't we? Aren't we just Christians as we're sitting here today worshiping God? Doesn't he, he doesn't see those parties or those affiliations or any of those things, does he? He sees us as his people, his chosen people. You know, these considerations... Thinking about God, thinking about how he influences our life should also inform us how we vote as individuals, shouldn't it? And that's a deeply personal and soul-searching question, too. No political party reflects the will of God perfectly, despite what people might think. They all have flaws. They all support things that are contrary to God's word, don't they? But we have to make a vote based on our conscience and based on our faith, based on our desire to see God's will in everything. 
We have to choose our leaders wisely, don't we? Who do we think will best reflect God's will in the world as a leader? You know, back in Jesus' time, they didn't get to pick their leaders. And I guess in that way, we have a special responsibility and a special opportunity to advocate for God in a small way by checking a box off on a piece of paper. But it is important, right? Voting is important. And when we vote, we should do so with a godly conscience. And whatever that leads us to do, that's what we should do. Finally, our mutual respect and willingness to serve God above all else should bring us all together into unity, should bring us together with a singular message for the world to be ambassadors for Christ. We can't let other differences cause hate and division between us, can we? That's not what God wants for us, right? God wants us to show the world that there's a better way than that. And I think in these times, there is a lot of politics out there. There's a lot of strife and division. And that there is a path to unity. There is a path to come together. And that path is through the church. Church heals, right? Christ heals people. He brings people together. He takes away the things that split us apart. He takes away the things that uh, cause so much division. He shows us the things that truly matter in life, doesn't he? And that's a, a, an awesome and wonderful thing. And sometimes those things, sometimes those things which God commands us to do end up falling into the political arena. But we have to be like Jesus, don't we? Not lose our compass and always focus on God. Render unto God what is God's and unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? Profound, but very deep and also very deep advice. It just extends to so many things in life. So we are and forever will be the people of God in all things. So if that means we're political, then we're political, right? At this time, I uh, want to offer an invitation that if you believe in God, believe in his son, Jesus Christ, and you have a desire to repent of your sins, your missteps, your mistakes, if you have a desire to do that, and you're willing to commit yourself in baptism to the Lord, then God has promised you forgiveness of your sins. He has promised you the Holy Spirit and eternal life. That's the, uh, the promise of God for those that believe, repent, and are baptized, that dedicate their lives to him firm until the end. If that's something on your heart that you want to do this morning, then I want to encourage you to come forward as we stand and we sing our closing song.